Welcome to the Black Writers Studio, a podcast presented by the Hurston Wright Foundation and hosted by Dr. Khadija Ali Coleman. The Black Writers Studio is dedicated to showcasing Black writers who are transforming the world today with their literary pen and creating a legacy for the culture. Shaki M. Jackson is a social psychologist, program evaluator, and writer. Her work has appeared in Cura, a literary magazine of art and action, Obsidian, Max Sweeney's, Pluck, Journal of Afrolation Arts and Culture, Midnight Breakfast, and Prairie Schooner, among other journals and anthologies. She is the author of two chapbooks, Surveillance and Language Lesson, Jackson is publisher at The Offing, an online magazine of literature and art. She lives in Los Angeles. Our bodies give into the ocean, rolling us beneath its tongues. How do we sing our loss with water brimming our throats? Oh, see, you are greedy and transform us, our faces soft and opening. You do not wash, but strike and shove. You rinse our babies from our arms, leave husbands waiting. We spin in your disregard. You up in this body, we praise your ruin, our monuments, rooting bones in all shores. Yes, yes, yes. Proclamation by Shaki Jackson. Tell, tell us about that poem. Proclamation was a response to um, a tsunami that happened in Japan. And it was, it felt closer than it was because on the coast of California, we had a tsunami warning. Mm. Um, so there was an earthquake, a tsunami, and then it just reached across the ocean. So we were all very attentive and worried and trying to get inland, um, not knowing what was going to happen. And there's this a painting behind me also from a colleague who at the same time was responding to that work and um his work behind me is actually wood that has been aged and then stained and left out and it's supposed to be a demonstration or an illustration of the markers that were put in the shore for all the lives that were lost because they don't have the bodies. At, at some point, they needed a place for people to visit, um, so they had put these markers in. But I had a moment to reflect on the way the water consumes people, which reminded me of a certain journey that our people took hundreds of years ago to get here and the decisions that people were making to jump off those ships. Mm. Um, and those bodies are still part of the memory, tangible memories under the water uh, that we know are there, but we might not be able to see, but we still honor. And I did want to give those voices uh, a moment to speak because there was nothing left but the sound of crashing waves what did they want to say? What did they have left? What if they were upset and pushed back and said, this is not the way I'm leaving. You will never forget me. I will always be here. Mm -hmm. um, and telling the water, you can't have me either. So those were some of the thoughts that I had when, when I wrote that piece a long time ago. And it just, it still resonates. Yes, it does. It still resonates. Yes, it does. So, and And can we just say for the record, that I requested you to read that piece. I had no idea that the piece of art behind you was connected to that work. Absolutely yeah. no idea. 
Um, this was newly acquired. This was acquired in the last two years, and that poem was, was written years ago. Yeah. I, I went to a residency in Eureka, and one of the hosts is a French expat who does this type of work. And I was trying to explain one of my poems to him, and he just showed me this, and I was like, it's uncomfortable to have you in my head. <laughs> oh, welcome. Because oh, wow. this is what it looks like. This is what it feels like when when you make something that can be seen right to memorialize but that's amazing yeah. and i i have goosebumps just um thinking about because i i am a believer of synchronicity i believe everything there's a reason for everything and you know reading that piece um and just preparing uh, my notes for my conversation with you today and looking over your work i selected that piece primarily because it resonated with me so deeply when we think about the landscape that exists right now, what is happening in the world, where, and and, and to know that you wrote this piece um, so long ago. Well, not that long. I, I, I saw a copyright for 2020. Was it earlier, written even earlier than that? It was written a bit earlier than that. Yeah, because okay, wow. the tsunami happened. It must have been somewhere between 2016 and 2018. Wow, okay. Like COVID memory... Um, is a strange thing. Uh, I, I didn't experience COVID, but the way that people treated time yeah. is how I treat time. I'm like, oh, look, it's daylight yeah. or it's nighttime. I can't tell you the exact day it is. Yeah. And I can't tell you when things happened anymore. Oh my gosh. So, you, there's no true word spoken. I literally, my, um, my partner, his office is right next. Um, I have the privilege of being able to work from home. Um, and my partner's office is next to mine. And I often call out and say, today's Wednesday, right? <laughs> no baby, it's Tuesday or Monday. Um, None of us are sure. Right. It's where yeah. are we? What is, what is happening? But I, I think what you're bringing up um, is a great segue into this work that you have forthcoming into the world that really focuses on this period that we know as um, COVID, when we are being obtuse and not a actually um, realizing that we are still in a global health pandemic, but we have determined collectively, well, not everyone, but that for some reason that was 20 to 20, 2020 to 2021, and now we have gone back or attempted to go back as th to things as normal. Can you tell me a little bit about this work that you um, have sure. that centers that that time period? Absolutely. And thank you for asking me about it. My work tends to be uh, a little sad or reflects on sadness or really kind of taps into grief. I read that. So, that, that, that is how you actually, um, you, when folks have asked you, I've read other interviews with you, that that is how you describe your work as being, and, and I find that particularly interesting because your work is in, you're a psychologist, correct? I am. So tell me about that. Tell me about that. I'm sorry to inter have interrupted. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'll tell you about the, the collection first, and then I'll tell you about my work as a social psychologist or a social psychological researcher. Um, the work, the chap collection is called Terry, mm -hmm. and it's my perspective or my memory for 31 days. My memory is for 31 days of what happened during that uh, the lockdown. Wow. Because people were pushing to put it behind us, as yes. you mentioned, yeah. or go back to normal. And once we've changed, we have changed. There is no undoing the change that we have experienced. Exactly. And I said, as a documentarian, I need to be able to write down these memories for myself, mm -hmm. for my family, and also for the people who don't remember because they were induced into a coma or they weren't fully aware of what was happening in that moment because they're too young, they were protected, et cetera. So I sat and I thought each day about the strange things that were happening simultaneous to the to our lockdowns or to us understanding this is Omicron. We have to get through it. This is Delta. We have to get through it. The waves that we experienced. So most of the poems are mirrors where on one side we're experiencing coronavirus and on the other side, there was a plague of locusts 
if you remember that. Um, I don't. Oh my God, what? You don't remember we had. So, oh my God. This is not what was happening in the Southeast when the cicadas emerged because it was time for the cicadas to emerge, but it was also time for the locusts to emerge over in Africa and they were eating all the crops. You might not remember that. I don't. And I'm scared because I don't remember that at all. The news was not, it did not focus on that because we're all trying to survive. Right. And maybe, maybe, I I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm misspeaking and I'm projecting a little much, but maybe the news broadcasters and the media were like, we don't want to panic you further Mm. because you all are out of control. So we're not going to tell you that just as lockdown was happening, Turkey had an earthquake that almost shook it off the face of the planet. Mm-hmm. I remember, remember that. that. Yes, yes. Um, we had so many interesting events that were happening in nature. Yeah. That I wanted to capture. Wow. People were like, the. we were just talking about time. People were like, time is really going quickly or I don't understand time. Yes. It's also because during the pandemic, the earth was literally spinning faster on its axis. Wow. And this was being reported and I'm like, yeah, is anyone it, else noticing this? It's interesting because, you know, I was wrapped up. So I literally had to defend my dissertation on March 13th, right before we went into quarantine. Wow. So I had to do it. I had prepared to, you know, how they say, you, you know, you have to have food and all these things for your committee and I had I was in the midst of planning to have my in person dissertation um, defense, and they were like, um, "The campus is shutting down. We have to oh. do it on." I, I, it was it was not Zoom. I think it was Teams, and mm-hmm. I had to ask folks if you know, tell my my family. But my dissertation was on um, dual enrolled African American homeschool students and their perceptions of preparedness for community college. I have a doctorate in education. And so if you recall during COVID, that's when everyone was taking their kids out of school because everything went Mm -hmm. on. So that is what I was focused on. And so as you are telling me about these things, I am now in 2024 realizing how tunnel vision I had. I was that entire year. You had to be. This is this is eye opening. So tell me, where did you start? Where in your 31 days that you're covering, what were you personally going through, and what where where could you even start as all of this is happening? As the world, as you say, is spinning faster on its axis. Wow, this is incredible. Yeah, so there was uh, the memories that I was writing was back in 2022. I'll say that it was a month in 2022 when I was just writing down all my memories. Okay, okay. And I have a lot of memories that are in the collection that have something to do with the medical setting because I have a role with um, the Department of Health Services in this county. So I was also seeing the trends that wow. the news reporters were talking about, right. about um, the we have run of space for ICUs, we right. have run of space in the morgue. So I would drive by certain sites and I would see the refrigerator trucks or I would see the parking lot set up for extra support. And I would see emails about, you know, we have to change our scheduling and availability because our providers are ill. Wow. What, 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 is, what was your role? Was it, or were you working with people directly or were you doing assessments for hospitals? No, our teams work with patients directly, but I am the data analyst and I have to go through charts to maintain certain benchmarks um, for programs that we're implementing specifically uh-huh. for materni- maternity patients. Okay. So pregnant persons who are at risk of preterm birth. Um, this is what we're trying to reduce. So I have to track these people who are now doing telehealth appointments um, and now are trying to figure out how to get the medical forward care and the social support care that they need without coming into our offices. And these are patients who are already dealing with hormones, anxiety, depression. And now you have a global pandemic, right? Right. Right. 
So I'm looking at the charts and I'm like, wow, our anxiety rates are really high or our depression rates are high or our domestic violence rates are higher than usual. And it's all about people being isolated. So that some of that is in very broadly, there's like no HIPAA violations, but my observations of <laughs> what was happening in the medical right. setting that no one was believing. Right. Um, just I slid that right into the conversation of can you believe that something out of the norm is happening right, right here? Right. And we're paying attention to this, but this is also happening exactly. behind, behind your back or behind the screen. Um, I'll briefly talk about my, my work as a social psychologist. I used to work with, uh, youth who were incarcerated and I was trying to figure out, you know, programs to make sure that they didn't come back into the system. So working with high risk groups has been kind of my career goal to reduce their poor outcomes. And in my current capacity, I lead a data team that is working on tracking um, how our programs and how our team members impact the pregnancies and postpartum year of our maternity patients for anyone who is Medi-Cal eligible. So while I'm in these charts, I'm trying to figure out any risk factors that would put them at higher risk um, or any protective factors that you know would be useful for our team to really maximize on. But I don't usually tell of those stories or the patient stories, even though those stories are incredible, incredible what the body can do. But I do talk about the environment in which we're supposed to be safe and protected. This is the first place we go when we're feeling ill. But during the coronavirus, you have to stay away because contagions, PPE is limited, the the trash bags with the, the tape was a moment mm. um yeah that was just a perspective that i thought that i could integrate into this work and it would make sense yeah it would make sense that with earthquakes and, and plagues um ebola made a comeback really briefly right you saw it. right right and i'm it- like oh you have to wait. You have to wait your turn, baby. <laughs> no, it wanted to join the party. It wanted to join it the party because it was everything. You know, very rarely um, am I able to be in conversation with someone who, as an as an ar- an artist, as a literary artist, also has the skill set that has allowed them access to a lot of the things that we're seeing. Um, that's forward facing. And, and, it, and it sounds like your medical um, positioning and that proximity to it will ultimately give a roundness to a lot of these things that we've, you know, written about from just seeing the outcomes, you know. And so mm-hmm. when when um, is that that is what's the title of it and when is it coming? It's called Terry. I am shopping it at this moment. Okay. It took me a little while because I wanted to add um, a an online component, a timeline. Oh, wow. That would capture some of the news broadcasts and some of the really beautiful acts. Like, do you remember banging pots and pans at 7 p.m. for the first responders? You were supposed to go outside and bang your pots and pans. They could hear you as, an, as thank you because we are dying quickly and you are risking your lives for us. Do you remember that? I don't remember the pots and pans. I remember horns and honking. Um, but yeah. no, no, no. So tell me about that. So yeah, it was it was another moment. It oh, was wow. another moment because after a while people were being unkind to providers. Right, right. I remember that. And I remember just the never ending work that um health providers had to um just really continue to be present at the detriment of their own health. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And at the risk of their families. Right. Um, There are just clips. There are news broadcasts. There are um, like Snapchats. Wow. Uh, There are audio recordings. I'm like, oh, I really want people to remember. So what if I add another sensory this, piece this makes so too. much sense because you know when i even think about you on social media 
And for our listeners, just for them to know that I reached out to you um, via social media because I'm such a fan of your social media presence. I think that you're so informative. Um, you you and it's it's it, I'm always wondering how does she find time to post on social media because clearly you are doing this work. Um, but it makes sense that you would want to accompany your book. Um, these this digital kind of offering, because this is something that you would sell. And this is really a gift of yours is that you're very multi, multi multi-talented. Um, but in this realm, you're boss, like you really, um, have a skill. And one of the things that I did want to bring up, um, is your work as a publisher of a, of a digital publication. Um, you do so much, you're an, an artist and as I've told you before we started, I really want folks to know that you are an artist. You are an artist. You are an artist because so often, um, particularly those of us who um, believe in um, Toni Morrison's words that if, you know, what she said, if you, there's not a book out there that you want to read, you got to write it. Many of us believe that if they're not spaces that are for us, we create them. And you have definitely demonstrated that with your, your work profile. Um, but you are an artist as well. And one of the many things that you do, you are the publisher and you are um, part of the executive board. Are you a founder as well of The Offing? I am not. The okay. Offing is just nine years old, but I was invited to be an executive editor maybe five years ago. And then um, I was asked to be publisher so Mimi Wong is our editor in chief and she's at the helm and she's like, let's get these pieces in order. Right. And right. Tell us what pu being a publisher, what does that mean? Beautiful question. <laughs> because I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> it's very expansive. Right. Um, but what I think it is, um, is the culmination of all the skills that I've developed in my literary communities. For example, uh, we talk about how we want to reach a broader readership. We want to make sure that more people are are engaging our work. And the discussion of accessibility came up. Mm -hmm. Like our readers are right there. They're in the same space, but maybe they can't uh, visually access the work that we're doing. So why don't we start asking for audio recordings as well? Mm -hmm. So that was one of the initiatives that I proposed the team. And it's a multi-year um a multi-year initiative where we've gone back. Uh, we started with our 2019 contributors and said, you want to record your voice for us? And <laughs> it's such a pleasure when people are like, yes, I am on it. I right. love my voice. <laughs> I love <laughs> my voice. Like, I love it. I love my voice. <laughs> I have recording equipment right here. And I'm like, how lovely. I love this for us. So we have to go back to 2015 and then we have to move forward, but it's a slow process where now when people come to some of come to our site, they have the opportunity to also hear the author mm. read the piece as intended. Mm -hmm. um, another one of our initiatives is the Offing Library, which we started last year because we are dead set on amplifying our contributors. Like you come to the Offing, we put your work out there. There's no paywall. We want you to access the work. Mm -hmm. But also, if you like this work, I bet you you're going to like the books that they've written. Mm -hmm. And I bet they're going to enjoy more sales. Right. And you're going to enjoy a first edition that's signed. Right. So right. what we're doing is asking many of our contributors if we can purchase from them directly five signed books. So when those come to us, we give them to our donor circle we make it. We make them available through raffles to our readership. This is what we mean by amplification. Like you mm -hmm. don't get to see the contributors just once. We're going right. to bring you back a couple more times. That's right. That's right. Um, and then another initiative is our podcast that we're working on because not everybody can be online, chronically exactly. online, like you see me on right. Twitter. <laughs> In my escapism mode. Like, was I calling you say. out? Was I calling you out? No, you were not. Because people see me. Right, people right. People see me. And yes, they better they see me. Yes. I think 80% of my retweets are literary and freelance opportunities because I'm like, I need everybody to be up. 
Yes. I need everybody's pockets to be fat. That is how you are. I love it. That's that is so much. And that's what I see about you. And that's, you know, that's so rare. Um, when we think of like, you definitely are a community organizer. You're, you're someone who cares about community and it's palpable. So we appreciate you. We appreciate you. And, you know, um, I learned from just reading your profile and the things you've been engaged with. Um, I've, I learned the wonderful, um, way that you you started to create some of your communities through submission parties and that yes. that is definitely a concept I, I will say it on the air and say to you that i will be stealing i i love this idea of gathering writers to submit together submission yeah. parties. i think that's fantastic it's not been taught consistently in mfa programs it's not been taught consistency in community writing right. programs so there needed to be a space where people could come together and ask questions and get answers yes. that are effective and useful and current. So uh, over 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago now, um, myself, Alice Dixon, who's also a Cave Kanam poet, and Sochi Hulisa Bermejo, who is um, Vona Macondo, I think Kanto Mundo, came together and we were in Sochi's living room with a table full of books, paper, paper clips, envelopes, stamps, journals. And we said, okay, what are we doing? <laughs> and we created steps on how to submit. I love that. And then the next time we met, we were like, here are the questions that I want answered about submissions. What about this cover letter thing? Mm -hmm. What do I put in that? What are tiers? Mm -hmm. um, how can we get support, financial support for doing the work that we do? Great. Mm -hmm. So we expanded those. We answered those questions and we expanded those. And then we're like, now we invite the people because we think we have an idea of what's happening. So that started um, Los Angeles, San Gabriel Valley. Um, and then we started to invite people to create chapters because we can't be everywhere all the time. So now it's international. Mm -hmm. um, over, I think there's somebody in Canada, there's somebody in Mexico, there might be somebody in the UK. I've stepped back so I could do more work with the offing and art share. And now Sochi Julisa Bermejo, we call her Sochi, um, is the director and she established it as a nonprofit. She's doing What's the of name of it? Things. What's the name of the organization? It's called Women Who Submit. That's right, Women Who Submit. And there's a website, if you are interested, that has a number of the chapters and the chapter contacts. Who I'm sure, available. what's the website? I'm sure our listeners would want to know what that website is. I believe is. it's still womenwhosubmit.org mm -hmm, mm -hmm. altogether, womenwhosubmit.org. And it's, uh, we invite women writers and non-binary writers because we base this off of, if the, the listeners remember, the Vita count. Mm -hmm. The Vita count was a consistent um and I think generally methodologically sound way to collect information from authors about demographics that were important for us to conceptualize or see who's being published. Mm -hmm. There was some pushback and you can see the pushback in the responses to that survey because I used to volunteer with them. Um, people who are, who have called the United States out on being obsessed with race. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's there's a reason for that we yeah. were built on that welcome <laughs> so, so but it you know it demonstrated or it showed that um women writers were just not getting that that time not getting that space and non-binary writers were getting even less less and we said okay well we can fix this if we teach people how to do it and then we spend time in social settings encouraging each other to do it mm -hmm. i remember doing our first submission parties that was full of food full of food and somebody brought champagne we would clap for everyone every yes. time they submit yeah it used to just be like three four times we applaud we might toast with a mimosa and when, when we got good at it, we were just clapping all the time. And I was like, okay, we need to take the champagne out of it. <laughs> we need to be focused enough to drive away. Right, right. Because it becomes a sleepover. <laughs> oh my gosh. We can't keep toasting every 10 minutes. Can we group these? I don't That's hilarious. 
So that's so fantastic. A, that's so fantastic. The sound, the sound that we were improving yeah. was enough for us to keep going. Wow. That you know, so that speaks the empire now. It, it's it speaks so much to how important because writing is so solitary. How, but how important it is when we have these moments where we come together and um, are able to be in community with one another, it just makes this pathway, this journey so much more enjoyable. And it's it's um, a proof of life, you know, yes. so to speak, to, to have these moments where, you know, you're not doing what you do to write in your office or a retreat or what have you, but you have these moments. So every moment, even the most mundane becomes celebratory. So this is, I, I, I love that aspect of um, preparing to, to talk with you. It's just, it just kept giving as I learned more and more about you before I actually had this opportunity to be in conversation with you. You're just such a fantastic um community being and you you do so much with with this um this life path to enrich the lives of others and i just hope you continue to to write um to do space um this this work this activating space work i didn't get a chance to dive deep into i was really impressed with um the public message that the offing has given to the public in terms of being a safe space for people during this this current climate of really mm -hmm. denial of, of the horrendous um, acts of imperialism and, and capitalism that have not only racked our country but now has um, you know entrenched itself into other spaces, other countries, and so um, I can only suggest to our listeners, our watchers, to go and learn more about the offing. Um, you have a um, statement called, it has a name. Refusal? The refusal. I never, I, I, I never, I've never seen a statement with a title. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. It, it's, it's just, it's like a, the refusal. I love it. And so I really would encourage our listeners and the watchers of our podcast on YouTube to, to visit the offing. Can you give them um, the website for the offing and then segue into where you would like folks to um, get to pick up copies of your work that is out? Uh, the offing mag dot com altogether is where you can visit all of our work. Uh, we publish poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, uh, essay memoir. And then we have a wonderful, oh, also art and comics. And then we have a wonderful section of cross-genre work that we do. One is called Back of the Envelope. So if you're interested in writing about space or nature, jump in there. Uh, Insight is about self-reflection, essays related to self-reflection. We have micro. If you can do something in fewer than 560 words, shout, please. Wow. We're waiting for you. Uh, I don't have my work out quite yet, but I'll tell I want it to be. <laughs> I want you to pick up books at. Um, I want you to pick up books at Skylight Books. You know, in the absence of of SPD, Skylight has is really a good place in Los Angeles to pick up poetry collections, um, collections from small presses. Also, the Reparations Club and the Salt Eaters, which mm. are both kind of the southwest region of Los Angeles. Those are both black owned book spaces uh, and third spaces to go sit and relax. Um, so three that I can think of off the top of my head. Oh my gosh, Octavia's bookshelf in Pasadena. Y'all go visit Nikki. She is doing <laughs> so much wonderful work in a region where Pasadena meets Altadena. And if you know the history of the Pasadenas, South Pasadena, Pasadena, um, it was historically unfriendly to uh, black residents, so they moved all the way up to Altadena, and Miss mm. Nikki has a good population of, of visitors who are of color, who are from that region, who are so happy that there is a warm space with current books, current collections um, for the community. So, shout out to Nikki at Octavia's Bookshelf. I'm coming. 
Look at that. Look at giving a pitch and giving us history. <laughs> the, the perennial teacher, you're just so fantastic. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Jackson. You're so generous. Oh, uh, thank you for spending time with me today. I appreciate it. I and appreciate you and the work that you are doing and amplifying what we're trying to do out here. Thank you for for watching me, for seeing me, and for inviting me into this esteemed space. Always. Happy Friday. Wow.